<laughs> Come on. I'm going to walk up song. I love that. I just wish I played for the Rangers. That'd be amazing. Uh, wow. Keith, thank you so much, man. And to have met moi, man, he's amazing. I mean, real life, kind of Apostle Paul, he's out there. And we get to support him. And many of us have met him, been on the ground with him, been walking from hut to hut or village to village with him. It's just amazing. So um, today we continue on in this Romans road trip. Anybody been on a road trip this summer yet? Anybody? Any of you planning on going on a road trip? We've had uh, students who've headed off to different camps and such, kids camps. We've got a group coming back from South uh, Texas right about now or today. We've got youth camp coming up this week. The camp is happening. So that's going to be amazing. I can't wait to be with our students uh, for a couple of days there, but be praying for our students. We'll hear more about that. You have an opportunity to be a part of that. So life-changing moments along the way, and it happens as we uh, journey even through the summer. So continue to be committed on these days. We're walking through the book of Romans, and we're also memorizing scripture. Anybody know what our memorization, our memori- memory verse is today? Anybody? Romans 6.23. Bam. One of you knew that. Okay. We're going to do better than that. We're going to be memorized. It's all in your bulletin. You can do that. But we're going to... Um, yeah, push you towards different uh, passages and such. And so we can memorize kind of the Romans road, it's called. Uh, so I remember when I was growing up um, going to see my grandparents. I want you to take a little journey with in your own mind. Uh, but grandfathers, I'm going to focus in on because today on our Romans road trip, we're going to find ourselves at Grandpa Abraham's house. We're going to stop off. Last week we were at the Grand Canyon. Um, we're going to be at Father Abraham's house today. And we're going to learn a little something about faith from Abraham. That's what Paul does in Romans 4. He goes to Abraham as a paradigm of faith, what it looks like to really believe in God. So we're going to get our little travel sticker. We're going to head to uh, Abraham's house. Now, when I was a kid growing up, on my dad's side, uh, we had um, my grandfather. My dad's father was a pastor for lots of years. He was actually an attorney for a bit. Then he went to seminary, became a pastor. And um, he was pop-pop to me, all right? He was Dr. C.C. C. Warren, but he was pop-pop. I don't know why we had two pops, but two, we're not just pop, but pop-pop. And then my, on my mom's side, it was Granddaddy Chester. Granddaddy Chester. And he lived with Ganny. Granddaddy Chester and Ganny lived up in the mountains. So my, my dad's pop-pop lived in Charlotte where I was growing up. So we get to see him often go over to his house. We'd have Christmas and all kinds of things. You know, we'd go over there anytime. But um, then until he kind of retired, moved. Um, but we would go see Granddaddy Chester and Ganny. They lived up in Black Mountain, uh, North Carolina, which we would go to periodically. They lived in a little house right along a stream um, where there were rocks and flowers. There's moss, salamanders. And you can imagine with two brothers, four boy cousins on that side there. To, I mean, it was heaven. Right. To go to their house and just play in the stream and go hiking and all. It was just amazing. So I have these great memories of grandfathers. Now, I don't know if you have that Uh, even now. Many of you, your grandfather, maybe still alive. You get to see him. And that's such a beautiful thing. Um, But but, you know, what would ultimately happen? Maybe this has happened to you. Uh, If you get old enough, this will probably happen where your grandfather will say, you know what? I want you to have something. You know, almost every time, like Ganny will be, you know, we take these, take these biscuits home, you know, or something. Take this, got cookies, right? Um, but what would happen was grand, granddad would actually go look for something. Like granddad Chester, he had a, a workshop. He was like a carpenter. It was amazing. And he would go, like, I want, I want you to have something. And granddad would get up, you know, maybe go, I, I, I have something I want, to, I want you to take home. He'd go in the attic. I think, I think I know where this is. He'd go into a closet maybe. I think, I think it's in here. I, maybe it's under the bed. And he's looking for something. I, and it's like an heirloom. I want to give you this. Today, this is what we're going to do. We're going to walk with Abraham. We're going to go to his house. And Paul's going to journey with us. And we're going to go to different places. Where is Abraham going to find this faith? That we're going to talk about. Where is he placing his trust? What does it mean to believe? And when we do this, we're going to walk through a really about four different places together. We're going to look at, you know, some of us, it's, it's kind of this way. What, 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 how is it that you're saved? What is salvation? Um, what does it mean to, here's what Paul would say. What does it mean to be righteous before God? That's another way of saying, how can I be right with God? Um, the question we often ask is, you know, if you were 
you were to die tonight, I don't know why we're always dying at night, but if you were to die tonight, um, and if you were to die today, and, and you were then entered, you know, before God, you stand before God, and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? Now, that's a reductionist kind of way to approach salvation. Salvation is much more than that. But if, why, would I, why should I let you into my heaven? How would you answer that question? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, it, it, there's different ways to unpack that question. What does it mean to be right with God is what Paul is going to say. So I want you to turn to Romans 4, and we're going to look really at four possibilities here that I'll unpack here as we go. And there's, I mean, Paul does. It's, it's clear. When I say salvation, again, he would say righteousness. When we say, um, are you saved? I mean, that's kind of a language we use. Are you rescued from, saved from what? I mean, there's this salvation, rescue. Saved from what? Paul would say, uh, have you been with me? Chapter 1, saved from the wrath of God. That's what. Saved from eternity apart from God. So you mean like if I don't have faith in God, he, just, he really gets mad at me? No, 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 no. God doesn't go postal. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't lose his temper. It's his holy reaction to sin. That's what wrath is. He hates anything. It would come against that which he loves. And when we don't know him, when we haven't, uh, we're not in right relationship with him, then we are sinful. We cannot have a relationship with him. So a key word is righteousness that we've been unpacking. Okay, being right with God. Another key word that he's going to redefine, actually, in the mind of the Jew, and for many of us, maybe even today, is the word belief. What does it mean to believe? And I'm going to challenge us today. And I hope mess with your mind and get you all crazy and asking questions, talking about this over lunch, right? Another key question is the, this, uh, or the word is the word accredited. Now, if you know Romans and all, you might know where this is going. Credited, uh, counted. Uh, it's a banking term. I want to set this up before we dive into it because you're going to see it nine times in this passage alone. Logizomai is the Greek word. And it means to transfer, uh, you could say it, transfer from one account to another. Okay, so think, um, or even make a payment. Like, so I need to transfer some funds if I'm going to cover the cost of this thing. Or it's, man, I got nothing in my bank account. Some of y'all, you know, students or young people, and, and, and your parents or somebody comes along and says, bam, I'm going to drop some money. Some of you are going off to college, right? And you're, frankly, you're going to probably be relying, mama, I ran out of money. Are you kidding me? You know, we had a budget, right? Um, uh, and that's when you bring all your clothes home, let mom wash them, you know, and then, then you go back to school. But what happens is it's a transfer. You're credited to an account. What you did not have there is now transferred over your account. So he's going to talk a lot about that. And, and where this goes, the questions that we're going to look at, it really kind of is formed this way. We're, we're on the search for salvation, okay? Where do we find this? Here's how this works. Three questions that help frame this. Where is salvation found? All right. What is the focus of our faith? Where do we place our trust? All right, you're going to hear me say this. Um, faith is transferring your trust from yourself to some, something, someone else. All right, And there's four places we go. If you're taking notes, it's pretty much this. We're going to break it down into questions again. But the first one is, well, um, good works. Most all, all people on the planet, apart from grace that we've sung about today, that's where you go. That's all you've got. Am I good enough? Okay, so good works. The other is what I'm going to call heritage, okay? Uh, just passed on to you, like from your parents, all right? The other's knowledge, okay? So being right, having right doctrine, right theology. The other is experience based on what you see or empirical evidence. Which one is it? Is it any one of these? And we're going to go on a journey because Paul is going to point to Abraham and say, eh, may not be found in any of these. And we're going to be wrestling with, well, then where is it found? So the first question is this. Is it in what I've done? Now, it, again, is salvation. It is righteousness. It is right standing before God. Paul continues his train of thought. And you might, if you've been here at all, if you haven't, he's in a dialogue with a rhetorical skeptic or questioner. And he's challenging someone who says, you know, here are the different ways that I think we're saved. And mostly it's through good works. Uh, and in fact, the Jew would look at, this is important to understand, the Jew would look at Abraham as the paragon of salvation by works, even though 
We know him as a father of faith, that he had great faith. He believed God. If you know the story of Abraham in Genesis 12, he's called out to be the father of many nations. He's 90 years old uh, when God says he's going to have a, have a child. I mean, right? He's, he's an old man. And he, and, and he, he says, you're going to be a father. His wife is 80 years old. Sarah, she's barren. She can't have kids. He said, no, nope, you're going to be the father of many nations. Abraham believes him. Now he calls him out. He says, I want you to go to a place uh, you don't really know exactly where it is, but I'm going to call you. So you might know the story in Genesis 12. He calls him out. He just believes. You're like, what is the deal with this guy? And then in Genesis 15, 6, it says, and he was credited, counted righteous because of his faith. Now you might say, well, with me, how did the Jews miss that? Doesn't it just say that clearly? Okay, well, we're on the other side of the cross, if you will. Uh, it's all that we know. Salvation by works. And Abraham is the man, even for Jews today. He's the father, you could argue, of three religions. The father of Judaism, Christianity, because we come out fulfilling, right, seeing Christ as the promised Messiah. And then even, even Islam kind of draws its you know, origins, if you will, kind of, back to Abraham. So he is the father of faith. But what does all that mean? Paul's going to say, let me break this down, and uh, I'm going to challenge all of your presuppositions about what you think Abraham was all about. So look at chapter with all that. Is the, fir- there, the first question is, is it righteousness, salvation in what I've done? And then he goes to, to chapter one, I mean, chapter four, verse one. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? In other words, according to his works, what he did. For if Abraham was justified, okay, made right by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. <laughs> He's saying, if he was all awesome, really great guy, and did all the good stuff, well, yeah, I guess he can be all prideful, but not before a holy God he can't be. And then look at verse 3. For what does the Scripture say? That's the key question for us all, always. What does the Bible say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted, accredited, credited to him as righteous. He was credited, or he was labeled, he was called, he was reckoned, is another way of saying it, as righteous. Why? Because he believed God. This is Genesis 15, 6 is what he's drawing from. Judaism, again, would say that faith is a work, that that you're actually doing something. And so it's a real challenge. And Paul is going to go the opposite, exact opposite conclusion when he looks at Abraham. This is is really mind-blowing stuff. They consider faith to be a work. And Paul says, Two fundamental reasons why this is a wrong reading of the text and why this is not the case and never has been. Is my righteousness, my good deeds, is is it found in in good deeds? Right? He would say, no. Righteousness is a gift. Look at verse 4 and 5. Now, y'all put on your theological, okay, thinking caps with me here because this is heavy stuff. Um, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted, there it is again, accredited as a gift, but as his due. Okay, so if you're working, then you you receive a wage. And to the one who does not work but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteous. Say, what? So it's not based on our works. It's based on our faith. Faith in what? That's where I want us to go. Is, watch this, is my righteousness then in what I do? Do I receive a reward or punishment based on how good I am and based on what I've done? No. Righteousness is a mercy. Not only is it grace, a gift, it's mercy. Okay, we avoid the wrath of God because of his mercy. That is, he withholds his judgment upon us because of our faith in him. And so he goes not just to Abraham, but watch this, to to David. In Psalm 32, he's going to draw from verse 6. Just as David also speaks of the blessing, that would be salvation, of the one to whom God counts righteous apart from works, he says this, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man or woman, boy or girl, against whom the Lord will not count his sin. That's mercy. You see, he's not counting it against us. In our, our account is sin. He's now accrediting, he's crediting, counting our, our account as full with righteousness based on our belief, not what we've done. So if Abraham and David uh, 
If they didn't find righteousness in good works, then why would we think we would, right? They're heroes of the faith, if you will. Here's what Paul's saying. Don't miss this. Paul is saying, many of us believe that, that salvation is brought because, you know, my good will outweigh my bad. Almost every person on the planet in some form will say, let me, let me ask you, if there is a God and if there is a heaven, how do you think you get there? And many of us, even in the room today, I think, is it not that my good works outweigh my bad works? And listen, Paul's saying this, there are no scales. There are no scales. They do not exist. So really? And he's saying that let's blow that out of the water from the start. There are no scales. Right. And so here's what I want to do. I want to I want to draw from. This beautiful chair that just kind of appeared over here. Um, this is actually a chair that's in our house. It's a dining room table chair. I love this chair. Is that a, that's a pretty awesome chair, is it not? It's a good looking chair. So this chair. Um, just roll with me, play with me here. But this, this chair has come from, my, uh, from my, my grandfather, all right? This chair has been through a lot. It's been through a lot of moves, been through a lot, been a lot of years with us. In fact, we have redone this chair. It's kind of scratched up right here a little bit. Even now, I'm seeing some marks. But we've redone this chair a few times. You know, sanded it down, restained it, redone it. We, we put some cushions on the chair, even. Like, this is probably third round. Of co- at least, you know, through the years, we've had to we've had to, sh- you know, shore it up and it's sturdy. I mean, we've had to go back and redo it a little bit because it gets uh, you know a little out of whack. But um, it is super strong now. It's awesome. But, you know, through the years, we kept it up and uh, we have done our our part uh, in keeping this chair as nice and beautiful as it is. All right. So a lot of us approach salvation that way. You know, I, I believe that yeah, I know that God saves me, that Christ died on the cross for me. But um, I still, you know, going to bring my good works uh, to to the table. It's like a lot of us, even when you miss church or something or you you don't do something that you should and you, you feel guilty about that. Now, there could be re- there could be a Holy Spirit conviction that oh, I should have been with God's people today or I should have read the scriptures. But sometimes we get into this this kind of scales, even in our Christian life, we do this. And we feel like, well, I'm going to bring, I'm saved, I got saved, but now I'm bringing everything I need to, to the table so God will be pleased with me. Or we sin and we fall short and I've got to really feel rotten about my sin so that I can somehow attain or work my way back into right standing before God. A lot of us, we have scales even in our Christian life. Think we're adding to the chair. We're, we're, we're making sure that we're keeping it as it should be. Look at the second question here. Is it, okay, righteousness, in what my parents have done for me? All right? Look at chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. In, in 9 through 12, he says, is this blessing then only for the circumcised? Is it, is it only the salvation then only for the circumcised or for the uncircumcised? Where we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? Now, you may not know the answer to that question. Paul says, uh, I know the answer. Okay. It was, it was not after, but before he was circumcised. In fact, 29 years later, he's circumcised. Yikes. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. While he was still uncircumcised. Okay, now, circumcision was a sign. All right? It was, and, and here, here's, the, here's the point here, and we'll finish that, that text. See, um, for better or worse, our parents impact our lives spiritually. Circumcision was on the eighth day for a male, and it was the mark of the fact that you're a covenant person. You're a Jew. Get circumcised, you are set. You got your mark for life, you're good. For the rest of your life. And, and, and this is what they believed. It kind of it was a summation of all the law that you believed the law. You're placing your trust in the law. But it's what your parents had passed on to you. The child has no real sense of doing anything. It's not a willful act for the child. Right. And, and so he, he's now turning to Abraham again. And he's saying, well, let's let's talk about Abraham, your boy, you know, the father of faith. And then he goes on, the purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. Wait, for, the, for those that aren't circumcised. 
and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Okay, now, Paul's argument, it couldn't be circumcision. It can't be adherence to the law. It can't be, well, uh, I'm, I'm a Jew, or in our case, uh, I was born in a Christian home. I mean, uh, okay, so how, are you, how do you know you're saved? Well, I grew up Baptist. Grew up in the church. My parents, they, in fact, they brought me to church all the time. And how about this? They made sure I was baptized. I mean, when I was a kid, I, I, I walked forward and I got baptized, so I'm good. Paul would say, nope. No. Your pastor would say, no, not baptism. Baptism apart from faith is in the same way circumcision without faith, without believing. Abraham believed, but now he's saying, and the Jews would say, yeah, and he was circumcised too. But Paul's saying, no, no, no. He was reckoned as righteous, accredited righteous, uh, Genesis 5, 6, before he was baptized. You see a train of thought here? He's like a lawyer making a case. He said, I know what you're going to think, but this is not the case. And many of us, we think, um, well, my parents, you know, uh, it's just been passed on to me. And a lot of people believe, maybe you're in the room today. Are, what, you know, are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. Meaning, a lot of us think, well, because I'm, I mean, I'm not Hindu, I'm not Buddhist, I'm American, you know, so I'm Christian. Paul said, no, 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 no. This is not passed on to you by your parents. In fact, many parents here, how can I pass my faith on to my child? You don't. Not your faith. You pass Jesus on to your child. You, you teach them the gospel is what you do. In conversation, you talk about what Christ has done. Believe that. You, listen, if it's, if it's faith in you and what you have done, that's not their faith, right? They're lost apart from a faith that they own themselves. So I'm, I, I, I'm messing with our minds a little bit, but, so, but here, we've got to get this right. You point your children to Jesus, because many of us grow up and we really do have the faith of our parents. It's why so many college students spin out because their faith was never their own as they were in the church. And that's why we're praying so much. A camp and other events like this can be so critical for students to say, man, I'm going to own my faith. This is my faith, not my parents' faith, not my grandparents' faith. This is my faith. And so it's kind of like, again, this chair just passed on to me. Man, I love this chair. And, it, you know, it's like if it was, you have a chair like from your grandparents, from your parents, it has all kinds of good feelings, man. This, this, I love looking at this chair. I have memories around this chair. Some of us approach church that way. We even sing songs that way sometimes. I love this song. It makes me feel all good inside. Love this song. Oh, let's sing that song again. And, and this, you know, I'm around this chair. I'm like, man, I love this chair. I love Ah, oh, this is a good chair. I love this chair. I mean, this is, and Paul would say, yeah, that's not faith. Not until you transfer your own personal trust does it become your own faith. All right, look at the third question. Let's press on. Is it in being right? That is, is it knowing the right things? Paul turns to the law, as you might expect. And in verse 13, he says this, for the promise and this is in, in your Bible, I hope you have before you. For the promise to Abraham and his offering that he would be heir of the world, what? Did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it, righteousness, is the adherence, or, or no, if it's the adherence, those who adhere to the law, who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, uh-oh, but where, is, where there is no law, there is no transgression. He's saying there what we talked about last week, if you were here, the law simply just shows that we're sinners. The law is God's holy standard. And he just says, yeah, you look at the law and it just shows you that you're a sinner in need of rescue. That's all the law does. So he's saying here then the question, is it in being right? The Jewish person again might say, well, I know the law. I know I've memorized a lot of it. Cognitively, I know what God has done. And we can do the same thing as Christians. I, I know the Bible. Uh, I understand the gospel. Uh, I've even studied the Bible. I understand that Jesus died for me. Uh, I get that. I, this, it, logically, I have sinned. He took it on himself. So I'm, I'm forgiven. Um, so, yeah, I'm good. Paul would say, no, you're not good. 
Knowing what he's done doesn't make you a Christian. Knowing the gospel doesn't make you a Christian. Knowing what Jesus did on the cross doesn't mean that you're saved. Now watch this. Look at verse 16. If I'm messing with you enough, we're not done yet. Okay, that is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise, this is a word that he uses a lot, promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, we said this, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who who is the father of us all. He's making this argument, not circumcised, uncircumcised, not Gentile Jews. Abraham is the father of all. How is this? He's a paradigm of faith, right? He's not focused so much on the person of Abraham. He's focused on what kind of faith did he have? It's the faith that saves us. So having right doctrine, right belief doesn't save you. Understanding the Bible doesn't save you. So, so it's, it'd be like this. It'd be like me coming over to my chair again. And in fact, how, how about this? I've got a little measure, measuring tape. So I can come to my chair and I can tell you this is 20 inches across right here. I could even, if I did the math, I could figure out what kind of arch, what kind of curvature we have here. What, what, and look at this. Here's what else I like to do. I like to show people that from here, from the base of it, well, from where you sit, right up to the top, or the back of the chair, it's just over 25 inches. Now, technically, though, from here, this portion, see, from here to here, is four inches. So you take the four inches, you add the other, right? In fact, here's what I love about this chair. This chair, from here to here, it's like 19 inches. And, and I love to do this. This is amazing. Nine, it's like 19 inches. I mean, my, it's 20 inches. I mean, it's just perfect. If I were to sit in this chair, it would, I mean, my knees would bend exactly where they ought to bend. It would be amazing for me to sit in this chair. It'd be awesome. This chair is incredible. I could tell you all about the kind of wood the chair was made of. I could even probably go to this cushion and think, I think I can figure this out. I could probably rip it open, look into it a little bit and figure out what it's made of. I could learn all about the chair and never sit in it. I'm asking you, do you know Christ? And if you're with me, you're going, I I don't know, Jeff. Come on, help me, bro, because you're messing with me. I hope I know him. And we all wrestle with this. Am I saved? Am I not? Have I made that decision? Have I not? Jeff, come on. Where does my my trust lie? Where does my faith lie? And why is he the father of us all? You all know the song? Remember when you were a kid? Anybody? Who who grew up in church? Okay, Father Abraham had many sons and many had Father Abraham. And I am one of them. So are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Okay. Right hand. What are you doing now? <laughs> Father Abraham. Said, right. Is that how it goes? And then left hand. Father. And then what at the end? You're doing this. That's a hokey pokey. Isn't that the hokey pokey? So here's what. Hey, what an awesome song. No, he's the father. We're, are you a child of Abraham? And the whole song means, do you believe? What does it mean to believe? What did Jeff land this thing, bro? You got me nervous. Let, how, well, okay, fourth. Here's the fourth one. Is it in what I experience? In, in other words, is it found in some empirical kind of evidence? Is it found in maybe it's a, it's a personal experience that I have? Or, or maybe it's, it's this thing of I just need... And here's where, here's where some of us struggle. We don't believe today because we want more empirical evidence. I, I got some questions. I mean, I need to have a, a series of questions and answers before I believe. And if you can explain to me this part of Scripture or why this happened or this. Paul wants to make it very clear that Abraham didn't believe God's promises because he had empirical evidence to do so. Do you know the story of Abraham? My boy's 90 years old and he's picking out baby names. He, he has nothing that would say, here's all the things lining up for you. Everything is, is you know, it's all, all lined up. Now you can believe. Paul's saying, no, that's not faith either. It's not based on empirical evidence. Look at this. It's not emotion. It's not empirical evidence. It's not what looks good. Uh, I mean, again, I can look at this. I can, I can explore this chair. I can, I can think this is an awesome chair. I am certain this chair will hold me up. It seems strong. All that good stuff. I love this chair. But watch this. Verse 17. He says, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, 
who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. So if you're going to go with, let me get this in my mind. Let me get smart enough. Let me have all my answers to all my questions before I believe. He's saying that's not belief. Belief, faith is something else. Look at verse 18. In hope, he believed against hope. Another translation, he hoped against hope. That's like saying my boy had no hope at all. And yet he hoped in something else that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. So shall your offspring be like the sands across the all the 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 grains of sand across the world or all the stars in the sky is what he said. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead. That's another way of saying brother was old. Okay, Um, since he was about 100 years old at this point or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. All right. Clearly, he needs a miracle. And so Paul is trying to say, look, it's not going to all line up. And many of us have come to believe, we kind of live this way, that if I place my faith in Christ, uh, if I become a Christian, in fact, I made that decision, and yet my life is not really much better. Listen, friends, be clear. The Christian faith is not give your heart to Jesus and all will go well with you. The Christian faith is you, you place your trust in Him. You receive His grace, the presence of His Spirit in your life, and He is enough regardless of what comes in your life. Because God's goal in our lives for us is not happiness, it's not comfort, it's not security, not to be happy, but to be holy. And Romans 8.28 says, he, and we sang about it earlier, He works in all things for the good of those who love Him. And are called according to purpose. But watch this. We don't often go to verse verse 29. The next verse says, and here's his purpose. To conform us into the image of Christ. We can trust him even when things go south. Even when our lives are, are, are in trouble. So here's the deal. If it's not in our good works. It's not passed on from our parents or grandparents. It's not in, in, in having right doctrine. It's not in some evidence or empirical something that I can get my head around and, and hang on to. If it's none of those things, ultimately, what is it? And this is where Paul helps us here before we go. It's in the cross. It's in the cross. It's transferring your trust from yourself to what Christ has accomplished for you. Look at verse 20. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. Now watch this. Abraham, no, he wavered big time. I mean, he sold out to his wife a couple times like, no, I'm not married to her. You don't take her. What? I mean, he wavered a, a lot. But he didn't waver on the single promise that he believed that God was going to come through for him. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. How are Old Testament people saved? How was he made right before God, before Christ came? Look at this, verse 22. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteous. So how are Old Testament people saved? Well, they believed that they needed a Savior. They were humble before God. They repented before him and said, I am desperate for you. And they believed that God was going to come through for them. They believed ultimately that somehow their sin was going to be covered by God himself because they knew they couldn't. They believed the promise. It's almost like this. Old Testament uh, people believed a promise that was coming. Now, did they know, well, Christ's going to die on the cross. He's going to be under Roman you know, occupation. He's going to die on the cross. They didn't know all that. They did know that God was going to provide and they believed in him. That he was going to provide a pro- the promise of a Savior to come. Somehow he's going to come through for him. And then they placed their faith in him and lived for him, worshiped him to his glory is what it says. And in the same way we do so. So the Old Testament, you, you can look, look at it like this, the banking analogy. They, they kind of have this credit of future, right? Credit for them. It's like we have a debit card, I suppose. We ha- it's in the bank. It's done. We come to salvation from different directions, but it all lands in Christ and his work on the cross. Everyone is saved through Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. So that's great for Abraham. What about us as we close? What about us? 
Well, verse 23. But the words it was accounted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus Christ, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Now, friends, listen, our account is full. And so what we must do is focus on the object of our faith. It's not even your faith. Faith of a mustard seed. It's the object of our faith that makes all the difference, which is why our memory verse, Romans 6, 23, says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the gospel in a verse. Memorize that one and hold on to it. People struggle because the scriptures tell us that there's only one way. People say, man, you, you Christians are so exclusive, right? Praise God that it's exclusive. Jesus alone satisfies the wrath of God. He alone has died on the cross, taken on our, the wrath of God upon himself, not to us, right? And so we can praise him today. And, and if you're still wondering about, man, I don't know if I'm saved, if I place my trust in him, you, you need to know this. Jesus said it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He's the only way. He's the one exclusive way. It is the most inclusive exclusivity known to man. Everyone can come because it's not based on your works, not based on what your mom or daddy passed on to you. It's not based on how smart you are, whether you got right belief, and it's not based on your experience, whether you cried at camp or walked down an aisle or said a prayer. Listen, I want to say this. Some of us say, well, I asked Jesus in my heart. Listen, we probably need to stop asking Jesus into our hearts. This is not magic. You can, I can go over here to my chair and say, chair, I love you. You're an amazing chair. I love this chair. I love how it looks. It feels so good. I bet you would be, oh, you could take care of me. Friends, listen. Not until, I can do all this with my chair. I can, it's not until I transfer the weight of my body from my legs to the chair. It's a transfer of trust. Have you transferred your trust to the only one who can save you? Have you actually sat down? Oh, man. Wow. I've been standing a long time. Some of you have been standing all your life. I can finally rest. Man, this feels good just to rest in Him. Have you transferred your trust? There was a day when I was nine years old, literally went to my grandfather's house with my dad, and they sat me down. I've been asking a lot of questions. And they walked me through what I now know is the Romans Road in my grandfather's house. And as a child, what little I knew, I said, I, I believe, I believe. And it's been a process for me ever since to learn and understand what Christ has done for me. But listen, friends, if you never have transferred your trust from your works, from a faith passed on to you, you need to get that right today. Getting it right, being smart enough, waiting for some emotional experience or some empirical evidence. You need to just trust Him. Just sit. And so what we're going to do, I'm going to ask the band to come up. And we're going to sing a song to close our time together. Proclaiming together how great our God is. And I don't want you to... You know, let's rush out of here. Let's go eat. Let's do. Many of us need to do business with God. All of us. Do you know that you're saved? Have you transferred the trust of your life and your salvation to the one who can save you? You can know for certain. It, you know, it, it, prayer is good. Praying to, to give the Lord your life, understanding what he's done. That is the starting point. But was it accompanied by faith? Did you transfer your trust? to Him, to live for Him all the days of your life. So I want us to pray together. And I'm going to ask you now, do you know Him? Have you given your heart to Jesus? You can do so now. You can settle this right now. Never question again, because it's not based on your good works. It's not based on what He has done, uh, or what you have done for Him, but what He's done for you. 
so a simple prayer. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I give you my life. I transfer my trust. Trying to be good enough. Trying to be smart enough. Trying to figure it all out. And I just just rest in you. Your finished work. And it's so good to rest in you. I give you my life. Lord, you are great and mighty to be praised. You're the promise keeper. You're the one who gives life. We are dead apart from you. Breathe life into us today as we give you our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.